What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Pack a Day podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day podcast, and please make sure to subscribe right here on YouTube if you have not already. Today's topic is going to be a look back at the 2022 NFL draft. You know the players, you know the names, but I wanted to go through the draft with a little bit of a benefit of hindsight and see what did Brian Gudikins get right, what did he get wrong. It's way too early. Let me start by saying that. I want to be very clear about that. This is usually some, this is an, not usually, this is an exercise I always do three years after the fact. Uh, you can see, I think 2016, 2017, 2018 um, out on PackerReport.com when I do this after, uh, you know, three or four years after every single draft. So it takes time to evaluate draft classes. I'm not trying to do that in totality today, uh, but I do think it's fun to, you know, just kind of look back now that we've seen some of these players through 13 games, both for the Packers and some players that were taken right around where the, the Packers were drafting as well and see, all right, what did Goody look, you know, what does it look like Goody got right? What does it look like maybe he got wrong? And, you know, just kind of what was available out there when the Packers were selecting. So that's going to be today's main topic. Before we get there, just a couple quick updates really quick. Really good injury news for Green Bay. Romeo Dobbs back practicing. He is going to be ready to go for Monday Night Football, so that is huge news. We should see our first real look at Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs, hopefully playing really sound football together and probably getting quite a bit of snaps, so that's exciting news. Um, and maybe more importantly, the only player that was not practicing for Green Bay was David Bakhtiari. Now, that's not great news in and of itself, but it was expected news, right? Still recovering from the appendectomy, and it's going to take some time as Matt LaFleur mentioned. So that was expected. He was never expected to practice this week. So the good news is everyone else was practicing in some capacity. Sounds like Aaron Rodgers is recovering well from his thumb and from his rib injury. So overall, great news on the injury front from the Packers. They also made a couple of roster moves. Dee, Dee Westbrook and Jack Heflin are gone from the practice squad. As far as Westbrook goes, once Nixon has basically, you know, solidified the returner job, both punt returner and kick returner, Westbrook, it seemed from the, the get-go, was brought in as a potential returner option once they moved on from Amari Rogers, just to bring somebody in who had the experience. He didn't really factor into the wide receiver room or anything like that. So once Nixon has pinned that down, D.D. Westbrook has no future prospects with the Packers. He's almost 30 years old. Like It just made sense to move on and go in a different direction. And then as far as Jack Heflin goes, I know there are a lot of people attached to Jack Heflin. This is not a, a you know any disrespect to Jack Heflin. He just had limit like extremely limited upside. His movement skills were far below average. And in a modern NFL, like if you can't really move that well as a defensive lineman, like you would better be a immovable nose tackle that's just not going anywhere along the defensive line. This is basically in in you know what I would say Heflin is is like a less mobile Tyler Lancaster and it is hard to be a less mobile Tyler Lancaster. So there was just never much upside. He was a really nice, you know, back of the practice squad guy. Like if all of a sudden, you know, a couple of your defensive linemen go down that you can bring up on game day, play 15 snaps and help you in run defense. I think he can play that, but th there's just so much limited upside with a player like that. And if you've, you, you know, you spent a couple of years on the practice squad and you don't see any significant improvements at some point, it's just time to move on. So no disrespect to Heflin. I hope he finds a new home. I hope he can find and have a successful career in the NFL. But I know, I, I think the perception of Heflin was far greater than what he was ever probably going to become as a NFL player. Um, and I don't think that this should be a super surprising move at all. In their replacement, or their replacements, I should say, uh, they get two offensive linemen, Gene DeLance, and then Michael Manette. If you remember, Manette was with the Packers in the preseason, training camp, etc. cetera. Uh, he returns to the team on the practice squad. And then again, new offensive linemen as well, Gene DeLance. So they get two offensive linemen added to the practice squad with the uh, two removals of Jack Heflin and Dee, Dee Westbrook. All right, that brings us to our main topic for today, and that is the 2022 NFL Draft. And just kind of going back, looking at who was selected, who was selected around that player, what other players were selected at that positions at that position right there after uh, you know the selection, and did Green Bay kind of get it right? So to go through this first of all, let's start with Quay Walker, right? Quay Walker was selected number 22 overall at the University of Georgia, obviously inside linebacker for the Packers, has started all season for Green Bay and has been huge in filling in for Devondre Campbell as well when Campbell was out. It's tough to imagine. I know this defense has been far below expectations, and I know that Quay Walker 
hasn't exactly had this standout season. You can see him learning on the job. You can st- you know, still see him thinking. He will flash the wild play every now and again. You will see him get sideline to sideline. The speed, the athleticism is evident, but he is still learning on the job. All that said, it would be tough to imagine what this linebacker core would have looked like had you know, Devondre Campbell gone down and there was no Quay Walker to fill in for him. We've seen some really bad Green Bay linebacking cores. I don't think Green Bay would have wanted to play a significant period of time with, you know, and even Chris Barnes was out. So now you're down to Isaiah McDuffie and, you know, it, it just, I don't think it would have ended up very well. So his presence on this team was still, I think, very important throughout the course of the season. Here were the next five picks uh, right after Quay Walker. Number 23 was Kerr Elam for the, the Buffalo Bills, the corner. 24 was Tyler Smith, the starting offensive lineman for the uh, Dallas Cowboys. Tyler Linderbaum, the center for the Ravens, has started basically all year. Jermaine Johnson, the edge rusher for the Jets. And Devin Lloyd, the linebacker for the Jaguars. So just to give you a heads up on some of the pro football focus grades for these players, Elam, 391 snaps with a 58.3 grade. Tyler Smith, 849 snaps with a 66.7 grade. Linderbaum, 847 snaps with a 73.4 grade. Jermaine Johnson, 199 snaps only with a 71.7 grade. Devin Lloyd, 743 snaps with a 50.5 grade. For those wondering about Quay Walker, 668 snaps with a 50.9 grade. So Lloyd and Walker, the two inside linebackers drafted at the end of the first round, you know, basically separated by about 80 snaps and almost an identical grade by Pro Football Focus. Now, we could look at all these, right? I don't think like Elam hasn't played enough and hasn't played well enough at corner. I think, you know, you would take Quay over him right now. Tyler Smith would be a very interesting discussion. He has been the Cowboys starter along the offensive line. He's played some tackle. He's played some guard. He probably would have stemmed the tide while Bakhtiari and Jenkins were out to you know start the season. And I think he would have been an integral member of this offensive line, both now and in the future. You could make an argument of like, all right, but where would he play right now? If Bakhtiari, well, with Bakhtiari out now, he probably is starting at left tackle. With Bakhtiari, you know, there, if Bakhtiari's at left, Nyman's at right, You've kind of got all of your spots spoken for. Elton at left guard. You've got John Runyon Jr. at right guard. Myers at center. Maybe he's a depth piece, but with Bakhtiari's consistent injury issues, with Elton Jenkins starting the season on IR, uh, with you know having to move pieces around going into next season, with Elton being unrestricted and a major contract decision on uh, David Bakhtiari, you can make a strong argument that if you were to redo this, that Tyler Smith would have to be very, very much in the discussion. And he's played some pretty sound football for the Cowboys as well. Linderbaum, same thing. Although I think you get into a little bit more of a conundrum because if you know Jenkins, Runyon, and Myers are all interior offensive linemen, right? So when Jenkins was out, having Linderbaum there would have been really, really nice. And you could argue that there's a really good chance that Jenkins is gone next year which would mean that now they could have probably Linderbaum at center. You probably move Myers to guard and then John Running Jr. at the other guard. So you have your interior of your offensive line solidified. You can also make the argument that Linderbaum has been the best of those players so far. So you could go in that direction as well. Jermaine Johnson's looked good, but in limited snaps. And then Devin Lloyd, as I mentioned, you know, that's basically just like a pick your flavor, right? Lloyd and, and Quay have both started. They've both struggled. They've both had their flashes. They're just two totally, not totally, but they're two different players. So it's kind of like, again, pick your flavor at inside linebacker. The next inside linebackers taken, Quay Walker was taken at 22, as mentioned, Devin Lloyd at 27. And then the next one, the only other one taken in the first two rounds after Quay Walker was Troy Anderson for the Falcons. He's played about a little less than 300 snaps with a 44.1 grade. So I think you can make an argument if they wanted to stick with inside linebacker that he got this right, that Quay Walker has at least been on par with Devin Lloyd and Walker probably has the higher upside long-term. Remember, Walker didn't play much in college, uh, at least not as like a starting caliber player would. And, you know, I think he's, you can very much tell he's still learning on the job. I think the long-term upside for Quay is very high. If you wanted to take a Tyler Smith or a Linderbaum or Jermaine Johnson, Devin Lloyd, any of those instead of Quay, I think you could make that argument. I I don't mind sticking with Quay here. And I think this is still going to be a very interesting long-term player for Green Bay. So certainly not like a a home run pick so far, but I think if you look at the other picks around it, you're not having major buyer's remorse. uh, And you certainly, there's no inside linebacker that was taken in the first two rounds after Quay that you're like, man, they really messed up and didn't get this inside linebacker instead. So 
That is pick 22, Quay Walker. Now let's move to pick 28, Devontae Wyatt. Only has played 125 snaps with a 63.0 grade. As I've talked about on multiple occasions, when he gets in the game, he actually looks pretty good. He just hasn't gotten in the game much and for some reason can't supplant the Dean Lowry, Jerron Reed, TJ Slayton grouping that are currently playing ahead of him. So that's where Wyatt's at. The next five picks were Cole Strange, the offensive lineman for the Patriots who started all year with mixed results. George Karloftis, the edge rusher for the Chiefs, who's started a good portion of the year, at least been a part of their primary rotation, 585 snaps for him. Daxton Hill, who has barely played for the Bengals. Lewis Seen, who was not set to have a role on defense, played two snaps on defense, and then of course had the season ending injury. Didn't really look great prior to that, which is why he wasn't part of their core rotation. And then Logan Hall, the defensive lineman for the Buccaneers, who's played 293 snaps, only a 38.0 grade for the Buccaneers. So Strange has been up and down, like I mentioned, starting guard for them. I think if you would do this over with this next five, the player I loved at the time, heck, I would have probably taken Karloftis. I know I would have taken Karloftis at the time uh, over Quay Walker. Karloftis has been a bit hit and miss. His run defense hasn't been great. He's gotten pressures on the quarterback, but you will see what you if you watch him, you will see that like he kind of gets like stuffed, and then he gets stuffed, and then he gets stuffed, and then he gets like a pressure, and he ends up with a decent amount of pressures, and he he has I think a handful of sacks on the season, and I really like his long term prospects. He hasn't been nearly as good as I expected him to be, but he's still part of the Chiefs' core rotation along their defensive front. As mentioned, he is starting to rack up some pressures. He is playing better. Better as of late. And I think that especially now with Rashawn Gary being out, and if, you, if everything else would have been the same, a long-term edge rotation of Karloftis and Enigbare and Rashawn Gary on the outside would have been great. And in the meantime, Karloftis and um, Enigbare would have been a perfect one-two punch uh, opposite Preston Smith for the time being. So I think that's probably the direction that you go in. The next defensive lineman that were taken after Wyatt, Wyatt was at 28. Logan Hall, as mentioned, was at 33 and has struggled so far. And then Fedarian Mathis was at 47. He played three snaps and then he had a torn meniscus. So it's as much as we look at Devontae Wyatt and say, like, man, that was a first round pick. He's 24 years old. They really needed him to come in and contribute. The next group, Cole Strange, like I mentioned, he's been okay as a starting guard. Karloftis has been up and down. Daxton Hill hasn't played. Seen didn't, wasn't set to play and then got hurt. And Logan Hall has barely played and he's struggled when he's been in there. And there's been no other defensive lineman that was picked after Wyatt in the first two rounds that you would rather have in his place either. So it hasn't worked out, I don't think, according to plan, but outside of probably Karloftis, it's tough to look at anything and say like they had a major miss. And even Karloftis, you can't just say like you 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 move him over at edge rusher and he's like a, a godsend of a, a player. He's He's been okay in Kansas City, but not much more than that so far. So that is pick 28, Devontae Wyatt. That brings us to pick 34, Christian Watson. 330 snaps only, but nine touchdowns, eight in the last four weeks. You know the numbers. Here were the next five picks. Roger McCreary, the cornerback for the Titans, who's been a starter. Brees Hall, the running back for the Jets, who looked great and then went down with the, I think it was a torn ACL. Uh, Jalen Petrie, the safety for the Texans, has had some really flashy moments, has had some really you know big blown assignments and stuff as well. So he's been very up and down. Arnold Ebiketti, the edge rusher for the Falcons, and then Kyler Gordon, uh, the starting slot corner for the Bears when he was healthy. All good players. Like You could make arguments uh, that all five of them would be fun players in green and gold. Nobody anywhere near what Christian Watson has brought to the table. So I don't think there's any question about this one. If you could redo this, you're definitely taking Christian Watson. Uh, the next wide receiver is taken. Uh, Watson was at 34. At 43 was Wandale Robinson for the Giants. 44 was John Mechie for the Texans, who was out for the season. 50 was Tyquan Thornton for the Patriots. 52 was George Pickens for the Steelers. 53, Alec Pierce for the Colts. And 54, Sky Moore for the Chiefs. Some good receivers here. Watson, as mentioned, 71.7 grade on, on 330 snaps. Wandale Robinson, a 72 grade on 229 snaps. Pickens, 685 snaps, so he's played significantly more, 65.8 grade. Alec Pierce, 63.1 grade on 530 snaps. And Sky Moore, 71.7 grade on 258 snaps. 
you you had a lot of really good options here. I don't, you know, if you had selected George Pickens, Alec Pierce, Sky Moore, you know, I, I think you end up with a good player. Again, I don't think you're taking any of those players right now over Christian Watson based on what he's shown. Yes, George Pickens would have been a fun selection as well. I'm taking I'm taking Watson right now, and I, it's it's an interesting discussion. But if you look at which one I think probably fits a little bit better in Green Bay, both now and in the future, like I said, I'm going Watson. I'm not second guessing it at all now. We have to look back at the trade though. They traded picks 53 and 59 to get up to pick 34. They could have gotten either Alec Pierce or Sky Moore at 53 had they just stayed put. So that would have been a potential option and they would have been able to keep pick 59. A player like Travis Jones, the defensive lineman for the Ravens, Jelani Woods, the tight end for the Colts. Uh, Drake Jackson hasn't done much, but I think he would have been an edge rusher that Green Bay would have liked based on his athletic profile. They could have got a couple of those guys. Like I said before, I'll say it again, I'm still taking Christian Watson right now. So I uh, can't can't fault uh, Goody for moving up to 34 and taking Christian Watson. That looks like a huge pick for them. Then you get to the really rough one. Pick 92, Sean Ryan, of course, third round pick, just pencil in bust every single year. They should trade the third round pick every single year. He did not play any snaps on offense. I think he played a couple snaps on special teams. I think it was literally two. And then it was suspended um, you know, for performance in anti-drugs. So major issue there. The next five picks, uh, Tyron Davis Pierce for the 49ers played 44 snaps didn't do much. Matt Corral, the quarterback for the Panthers, is out for the year. Zachary Carter, the defensive lineman for the Bengals, 322 snaps with a 29.3 grade, so really rough start for him. Nick Cross, the safety for the Colts, only 118 snaps, 55.1 grade. And then Kirby Joseph, the safety for the Lions, he's been a really nice player for them. Starter, 636 snaps, 67.5 grade. You also had two running backs selected not too far after that. Brian Robinson, the starter for the Commanders, and then Damian Pierce, the starter for the Texans. And so had they gone a running back, they could have maybe picked up a Robinson or a Pierce. Instead, they go offensive lineman. The next three offensive linemen, Logan Bruss, no snaps. Daniel Falele, 162 snaps with a 50.5 grade. And then Max Mitchell, who's got a couple starts under his belt, a 341 snaps with a 55.5 grade. So not, it's not like, again, that you missed on something huge here. Yes, a, a Brian Robinson or a Damian Pierce would be really nice to have instead of Sean Ryan, especially when you're looking at you know Aaron Jones and his contract coming up and maybe having to go in a different direction. Not hoping that's the case. Would love Jones to be back in some capacity, but neither running back probably would have factored into the Packers all that much this season, if we're being honest. And yeah, Kirby Joseph, an extra safety, sure, that would have been nice, but it's not like any of the next five picks. Maybe Corral goes on to be a great you know, long-term play for the Panthers. We'll have to wait and see there. Uh, but again, the, the next few offensive linemen haven't exactly lit the world on fire. And outside of Kirby Joseph, who's been a solid starter for the Lions, it's not like you missed too much, but Sean Ryan definitely looks to be a major miss up until this point. Then you get to number 132 overall, Romeo Dobbs. He's played 412 snaps, 60.6 grade per PFF. Here were the next five picks. Jake Camarda, a punter for the Buccaneers. Spencer Buf Burford, a starting uh, offensive lineman for the 49ers. Joshua Williams, who's played uh, 387 snaps as a defensive back corner for the, the Chiefs. He's played pretty well so far. Cordell Volson, a starting offensive lineman for the Bengals. And then Bailey Zappi, the quarterback for the Patriots. So all of these you can make interesting cases for, well, outside of the punter. Uh, but you've got two starting offensive linemen, a corner who's played pretty well in almost 400 snaps, and then Bailey Zappi, who looked rather interesting when playing. You're still not taking any of them over Romeo Dobbs. So this looks like a really good pick by Brian Gutekunst as well. The next four wide receivers that were taken, Kelvin Austin has been out for the entire year for the Steelers. He will not play this year. Huge bummer for them. Khalil Shakir was probably the next best one. He has about 200 less snaps than Romeo Dobbs, has a slightly better grade per pro football focus. He's made a couple really impressive plays for the Bills as well. You're still not taking uh, him over Romeo Dobbs right now. And then the next couple were Montreal Washington and Kyle Phillips, who haven't done anything. So this looks like another really sound pick for Romeo uh, for the for Brian Gutekunst with selecting Romeo Dobbs. And you know some of those guys would be fun. Volson and you know Burford would help out along the offensive line. Zappi would be a fun project at quarterback. But you're, you're taking Romeo Dobbs 100 times out of 100 given those choices. Then you get to Zach Tom, pick 140. 261 snaps, some starting reps, 68.0 grade, potential long-term starter for the Packers. Next five picks, Demarion Williams, corner for the Ravens. Kobe Durant, corner for the Rams. 
Uh, Chigoziem Okonkwo, the tight end for the Titans, who actually had a pretty nice game against the Packers a couple weeks ago. Sam Howell, the quarterback for the Commanders. And then Darian Kennard, the offensive lineman for the Chiefs. Uh, the next three offensive linemen taken after Zach Tom, Kennard, who we just mentioned, Matt Willetsko for the Cowboys, who hasn't done anything. And then Braxton Jones, who has been a starter for the Bears all year and has looked really, really good. 809 snaps, 74.0 grade, came in from day one, took that position and has really held up really well, all things considered, especially being a, a fifth round rookie there. So some interesting choices here. Okonkwo looks like a potential long-term starter at tight end. Howell, while he didn't get to play, had some real flashes in preseason, would have been a really interesting project. And then Braxton Jones has been a starter for, you know, since day one at left tackle for the Bears and has looked pretty darn good as well. You don't mind the Zach Tom pick. It would be tough to take Howell over him when he, we haven't seen any regular season snaps. A Conquo would certainly be interesting, as would Braxton Jones. I don't think you're going to you know, be too upset that Zach Tom is your pick here. If you wanted to go Braxton Jones ahead of him, by all means, he's played more and arguably he's played better. I still like Zach Tom's upside probably a little bit more, but uh, you, you couldn't go wrong with either of those picks. A Conquo would be a really interesting upside pick and even Sam Howell a little bit interesting, but again, I don't think you're going to be too upset about Zach Tom at pick 140 based on how he's played so far. Next up is Kingsley JJ Inigbare. Next five picks, Matt Ariza, the punter for the Bills, who got released with all the off-field drama. 181 was Kyron Johnson, linebacker for the Eagles. Darian Beavers, linebacker for the Giants. Kevin Harris, who had kind of a nice week this past week for the Patriots, a running back. And then Vidarian Lowe, an offensive lineman for the Vikings. None have really done much. The next edge rusher that was taken was Sam Roberts at pick 200. He hasn't done much. This is a super easy one. You're taking JJ and Igbare out of those options. Again, 100 times out of 100. And really, you know, so far you go through this. Sean Ryan, you would like to have back, but you know, Quay Walker, he's at least in the conversation with the next group. Devontae Wyatt, same thing, even though he hasn't worked out, like, you know, outside of Karloftis, you don't really mind taking him over the other guys that were selected right around him or at the same position. Watson was awesome. Ryan was a bust. You know, Romeo Dobbs turned out great for where he was selected. Same thing with Zach Tom and then JJ and Igbari. So really great selections. And then that brings you to the seventh round. They had four seventh round picks. I'm not going to do the same exercise here for all uh, all four of them, but two, uh, 228 was Tariq Carpenter, who's been on the roster and has actually shown some flashes on special teams. Jonathan Ford, redshirt season as a defensive lineman, who's on the 53 though. Rashid Walker, same thing for the offensive line on the 53, red shirt season, uh, offensive tackle, of course. And then Samori Toure picked 258. I think the craziest thing is that they took Carpenter, Ford, and Walker over Toure. I said that at the time, even more so now, but what a pick at pick 258 uh, to get Samori Toure, a player who might end up being uh, you know, a really long-term wide receiver for them. Probably not ever like the guy, but you know, if he, he ends up as like a you know four-year guy as your you know number four wide receiver, by all means, like yeah, that 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 sounds awesome. So like like the group overall, especially for seventh round, these again are you you know blindfold yourself and throw darts at a dartboard to have four guys that at least made the initial 53, one of which has shown some signs of being able to to maybe make a player out of himself down the road. Tariq Carpenter, kind of a core special teams guy already. And then two two developmental guys, one on the offensive line, one on the defensive line. You don't hate that. There's three players that would have been of some interest in, in some way. 251, Isaiah Pacheco, the running back for the Chiefs, who's had a really nice season as a rotational running back for them. That would have been a great pick. You know, if, if you, you know, if they could have taken him instead of a Jonathan Ford, that probably would have looked really good. Pick 255 was Trenton Gill, who's been the punter for the Bears, has had a nice season. That would have probably got you maybe closer to a long-term punter instead of just kind of a stopgap with Pat O'Donnell. Um, not anything, again, you're losing any sleepover. And then Mr. Irrelevant, pick 262, Brock Purdy, quarterback, San Francisco 49ers, who looked you know, almost phenomenal last week. We'll see if the Cinderella slipper falls off uh, as he moves forward and if it was just kind of a one-week thing. Uh, but that was a pretty impressive performance from Brock Purdy. That would have been an interesting selection for the Packers as well. But again, you're not losing any major sleep. And Carpenter, Ford, Walker, Toure, all in the 53, all have some long-term prospects. And Toure, a really, really nice pick at 258. A couple other quick notes in regards to this draft. Sixth round pick, number 209 overall, was actually Luke Tenuta, who they were able to uh, claim off of waivers. So they actually got an additional sixth round pick in this draft as well. They just got him 
you know, via waivers rather than actually selecting him. And uh, he is still on the 53-man roster, has uh, not made any impact, of course, yet, but we'll see if they can get something out of that. It, it's a bonus six-round pick, you know? It, it's it's not a, a bad thing to, to claim that player and see if he can ultimately turn into something. So they actually were able to pick him up as well. And then three undrafted free agents that are still on the roster that they initially signed. Uh, Jack Coco, a long snapper, of course, who's been their long snapper all season. Caleb Jones, who made the 53 and then went on the non-football injury list. He's working his way back. We'll see if he actually gets back to the 53 or not. And then Tyler Goodson, who is on the practice squad. So overall, you know, like I said, you'd really like that Sean Ryan pick back. You could make some arguments with Quay Walker and Devontae Wyatt if you could have gotten, you know, somebody that was picked around there that maybe would have been a little bit better. Maybe one of the offensive linemen for Quay, maybe George Karloftis for Wyatt, but you love the Watson pick. You know, the Sean Ryan one you would love to have back, but nobody, it's not like there's a, a Pro Bowl rookie that's playing that was selected right around him that you're, you know, just super ticked off about. Romeo Dobbs, great. Zach Tom, great. JJ and Igbari, great. And then four seventh round picks who have some upside, including Samari Toure. So this seems like a very, very good draft for Brian Gutekinds. All of these players we're going to, of course, closely monitor as their career continues. We won't know until three, four years from now to see where these players are at and just how good this draft can ultimately be. But positive signs early for these draft picks. And what Brian Gutekinds really needed to be a strong draft, he might have gotten a very, very strong draft. So we will wait and see. We will continue to watch these rookies closely, but that's going to do it for our episode today. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. So make sure to subscribe if you haven't already, but until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.